Good day. Welcome to the Japan Zoominar at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm Ulrika Shader and I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. Uh, GPS stands for School of Global Policy and Strategy. It is a graduate school at UC San Diego that uh, concerns itself with international relations and public policy with a focus on the Pacific Rim. Among our various degrees, we have a Master's of International Affairs with a Japan specialization uh, and an international management track. If that's of interest, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. JFIT is the Japan Center at GPS. Uh, we conduct research, education, and information on Japan. Uh, here at UC San Diego, if you're interested in our Japan Center activities, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu. Uh, I also have my own website with a blog. Uh, you can visit it at thejapanologist.com. Our Zoominar is a weekly event. Uh, it's every Tuesday at 4.30 p.m., which currently is Tokyo time 8.30. Uh, today, of course, we're going to talk about business, as you know. Uh, looking forward, while I have your attention, please note that next week we will shift to security matters and the role of alliances and geopolitics in turbulent times in the Asia Pacific. And we'll continue on that theme uh, on October 13th. After that, we'll turn to working women, and then we'll go back to politics and talk about uh, Shinzo Abe. You can look at all of these uh, upcoming and also the recorded previous uh, Zoominars at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoominar. Today, of course, I have, uh, as you know, uh, with me, Mr. Kazuhiko Toyama. And so let me stop my share so that you can see him as I introduce Toyama-san. Toyama-san, welcome to the show. So hi, let me, hi, uh, hi, hello, and maybe good evening. <laughs> that's right, Tokyo, Ohio, was I must. Good morning. So you're joining yes, us from Tokyo, and thank you for getting up for us and uh, uh, spending an hour with us. So let me introduce you briefly uh, before we start our conversation today. So mm -hmm. you uh, you started out in a fairly normal with a degree from Todai, Tokyo University, in 1985. Yeah, yeah. You also have an MBA from Stanford, 1990, from the business school, where you tell us you. Uh, played a lot, but uh, all of us who know you uh, know that you paid a lot of attention in the accounting classes, uh, of which more in a moment. Um, you then uh, started your career at BCG in Tokyo and uh, became a member and eventually CEO of CDI, which was one of the early domestic Japanese consulting companies. In 2003, you were called in to lead IRCJ, the Industrial Restructuring Re 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 Revitalization. Of Revitalization, I'm sorry, Saisei Kiko. So, so Sangyo Saisei Kiko. And uh, that was a government backed uh, restructuring fund. And your task was principally to show that Chapter 11 style restructuring was actually possible in Japan with all of the yeah. main banks and the cadets and all these lack of sort of legal background for that, you guided companies like Daie and Kanebo and, and of which more later um, through a restructuring process. I, uh, IRCJ had a four year lifespan. So then you left IRCJ and started IGPI, um, the industrial growth platform. It's the, you actually made up the Japanese, I think for that, right? This KA Kyozo Kiban. Yes, yes. And uh, these Kyozo word in the middle is a very interesting sort of uh, co creation. <laughs> it, it means growth, revitalization, restructuring, reinvention, all of those. So, uh, till today, uh, you are the managing, uh, managing partner at IGPI. Indeed, today still you are a CEO, but tomorrow no longer. So, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> you'll, you'll remain, of course, there. You are also the chair of the Public Policy Council at the Keizai Doyukai, which is sort of the alternate to the large Kedan Ren. You're an expert member on a variety of committees, Ministry of Finance, Cabinet Office, Financial Services Agency, METI. Uh, you're an outside director of Panasonic, uh, maybe some more that I don't quite know. And you have written more than, I believe, 10 books, including, I brought them all, actually, it's a, quite the luggage, <laughs> including very recently, two books on the CX, the corporate transformation, and the Corona shock. And that book, 
this yeah. is a complete <laughs> coincidence. Looks very similar right. to mine. And indeed, Toyama san, uh, I, over the last 10 years or so, I've learned a ton from you and you've actually influenced some of the positive views in my book, because as long as you're there and helping Japan, there is a future for corporate Japan. Uh, you spent actually some time with us uh, at the Center for Global Transformation. It's about 10 years ago, Yasuko and you came out, and then your son Ray and your daughter-in-law Sissy are graduates from our program. Yeah. So you've been a, a fantastic friend, collaborator, colleague, and, uh, and you've taught me a lot. So thank you, and thank you for joining us. So we got to have a conversation here uh, and people can sort of type in the Q&A as we go. Uh, we've prepared some questions. So let's start uh, with that and then I'll weave in uh, what, whatever people have to ask. So the IRCJ thing, that was really where everything got started, right? So Japan was in a bad time. The government says, look, we have to do something differently here. And you led the turnaround of as I mentioned earlier, of Kanebo and, and, and oh, Daiei, yeah. and then later you were also involved in Japan Airlines, yeah. and then later you helped TEPCO. Oh. As you reflect back on those early cases, what, what could these managers have done differently and, and, and what has changed since? Um, maybe, well, until late 19, maybe around 90, 1990s, uh, when people call the uh, Japan as number one, uh, very much the system of a uh, Japanese economy is, as you said, good or bad, very informal, more, I mean, uh, sort of ambiguous uh, group management as a whole industries, but uh, more mutual style, uh, something like a family type of the uh, kind of management. And also inside the company, the company is supposed to be, uh, I mean, keep the employee for the lifetime and uh, uh, basically very homogeneous people are running the companies and the very continuity is important. And uh, basically the strategy is making the production in, in a medium Japanese way and the high quality and the improvement and Kaizen and so on and so forth and uh, uh, producing very, very nice products and exporting all over the world, especially to the United States. That was the main strategy of Japanese companies. But uh, after the bubble crashed, uh, those systems was not really working too well uh, compared to the 1970s, 1970s, 1980s, because, uh, for instance, China or other countries are catching up with the Japanese business models. And so uh, many companies were facing more uh, drastic strategic pivot. And uh, also they, uh, they are facing the uh, uh, very big, big debt hangover after the, uh, the uh, I mean, disease of uh, uh, bubble economies. So, but uh, when they face those problems, uh, they need a very strong leadership and a strong legal background to go through the uh, very uh, hard, uh, sort of hard landing uh, restructuring. But uh, many, many Japanese companies and leaders are very hesitant to do that. Also, the Japanese banks are also same and behaviors because they are mutually very independent. So uh, if they go through very severe, very hard landing, very fast moving restructuring, and Japanese banks are not ready to write off those, I mean, loss in, in, in the short runs. So they tend to, I mean, postpone many, many problems and they try to solve taking long, long time. So that was something happening after the bubble crash in 1990s. But, uh, in, but in those days, global, a sort of globalization was going on globally. Uh, the Astro economy. Also, the uh, some digital transformation was starting. So many, many innovation was going on. So uh, uh, the biggest problem is that, is that if if that, if we if we didn't face such a huge uh, change of the uh, business back, uh, business, back business environment, it's okay to take time, but uh, uh, it was not allowed for Japanese companies. So, uh, but eventually in 2002, Koizumi, Mr. Koizumi Prime Minister came in. And he decided to, I mean, um, I mean, accelerate the restructuring pace. But to do that, they, uh, we, we needed two, two things. One is a strong legal background. And the other thing is money, especially risk money, uh, equity base. So uh, that's why uh, IRCJ was uh, set up. But uh, the first big um, challenge we faced was that the many, many I mean, companies and banks didn't like that. <laughs> they want to postpone the problems all the way. 
because once they start the game, they will face very, very serious problems like uh, like uh, firing people and selling a part of the business or something like, uh, uh, I mean, we, uh, I mean, uh, uh, splitting the company uh, uh, piece by piece. So those are the things, the very worst things and also media hated that kind of idea. So, and also uh, one interesting thing is that uh, for valuation, the pricing of the company, they didn't like, I mean, market, market, like market price based. So they liked the, uh, I mean, book-based pricing. So once they bought one asset with the one, one, million, one million US dollars, they wanted to keep the one million, one million dollars as, as it is. Right. But, uh, we, but uh, to, to try to restructure the company, we, we, I mean, we re-evaluate re, re the dot price down to the market basis at, at, on the, on the, at, at the timing. But uh, they didn't like that. But, uh, but, and also they didn't like the uh, cash flow-based pricing. So cash flow sounds like I mean uh, I mean evils I mean spell spelling of the U.S. I mean a conspiracy something like that. So but uh, we put that like a new idea such as MBA based or, or more I mean reasonable I mean uh, things into Japanese I mean uh, restructuring and the corporate M and A's and those things. So so those are those are big challenge, and uh, so but uh, we very successfully closed our you know, challenge in RCJ because, because simply we went through the very reasonable things uh, on the economy basis. So, uh, but, but that was a big challenge we faced at the time. So in, in this book, uh, which is from, from this year, mm -hmm. you, this is about the CX, the corporate transformation together with the DX, the digital transformation. Yes. You have a chapter on uh, Japanese companies being the membership system of lifetime employment, right? So the Japanese companies you write are the buy salary man, salary man is a Japanese word, salary man is yeah, yeah, a yeah. Japanese word for organization. Lifetime employment worker. Yes. Buy salary man, for salary man, with salary man. <laughs> and and um, that that this still continues. Is that is that right or has, has that changed? Uh, it, it still continues basically. And but uh, uh, big progress in especially uh, after the Abe Abe San came in, came back to the government administration was that many uh, Japanese companies and the managers are realizing that they have to change. But uh, but but the big problem is that those uh, membership system or salary man system lasted more than fifty years. So many, many things formally, informally institutionalized in not just company, but also whole so social system of this country. But the problem is that uh, lifetime employment and uh, um, uh, the seniority system implies that company members are very homogeneous and very static. So uh, it's okay when the, uh, the their basic strategy or business model is just continuous improvement, it's okay. Because basically the nature of the business is not really drastically changing. So a very, I mean, a, a, a piling up the a small incremental improvement is okay. But the, but the problem is that many companies are facing more, more, much more drastic strategic pivot or new, they have to, I mean, uh, like in, involve the more new uh, talent and new ideas and those things. But the homogeneity basically hate that kind of change as a kind of immune system. So that's why uh, the Japanese company has been struggling, struggling uh, especially uh, when they're facing the digital transformation such like electronics industries. So now they, are, they understand that, but uh, changing, change those old systems to new systems is very, very hard things. So that's the uh, big challenge we are facing now. So what do you think it is like today now? So, so we have a lot of pe people uh, listening to us who know quite a bit about Japan, but what they hear and what we read in the, in the news is, you know, Japan is doing great and it's not great and mm. worse and bad. And, and, and so, so what is the state of, of, the, of the business world? Not the economy, but, but if you look inside businesses, and there are a large number of companies that are trying to do better. Uh, How, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the what is the current situation? Uh, well, I think as for the successful company or success business in Japan, is the two patterns. One is the uh, company still the company still the company uh, where their business domain 
is not really changing. So the, I mean, traditional Japanese management system works. So uh, the, typically that was, uh, auto industry is still that way. Basically Ford production system is not really changing. <laughs> Or the so, Toyota uh, production system. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, uh, but of course, when the uh, case come in, such a, like, I mean, um, uh, uh, I mean, ele ele electronic cars and those things come in, they might change, but still, basically, they're engine cars, uh, majority. So, uh, and uh, so Toyota is still doing good, and that, uh, the company around Toyota is still doing good. So that's one category. And the other category is that the company who successfully uh, transformed itself to fit into the new environment. I think, I believe I'm wrong, uh, those companies are one of typicals. So those two patterns. But uh, I would say maybe, maybe you, you will agree that, the, that those companies are still 20% of the whole economy. So yeah, so uh, my, my dear friend and former student, uh, Yoshi, uh, pointed um, this out in reaction to my book. And he said, yeah, um, it really, isn't this a, a situation of the 2080 where, mm -hmm where you know Japan is the third largest economy in the world there are some great technologies that come out of Japan the aggregate niche strategy you know the dominance of certain niches but that's that is really 20% of all companies accounting for 80% of you know the the, the 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 positive activity and that's of course the companies that i write about yeah yeah, yeah. and the other 80% are you know are, are still struggling and and you're my i guess is your your company and, and you work with the government is uh and maybe abenomics wanted to sort of get the next 20 percent of japanese companies to the global level is that uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah yeah so abesan did a very great great good job as for uh, i mean encouraging the uh, good 20 20 percent company to do, do better and uh especially uh the many Japanese managers used to be, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm saying the, uh, uh, we have many, many excuses, such as the uh, uh, exchange rate, and uh, also, uh, uh, I mean, uh, termination regulation of the uh, laborers, and uh, also uh, 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 tax, high tax, corporate tax, tax rate, or so on, so on, so forth. And they say that's why we are not doing well, doing worse than Japanese, US companies or Chinese companies or European companies. And, but uh, Ab Abenomics reformed many of those things. So now those excuses are going away. <laughs> right? So, so, so mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, but uh, uh, the fact is that their performance did not change drastically after those, I mean, their, their handicap gone. So they realized, the, oh, that's my problem. <laughs> so uh, very good things about that. And the other thing <laughs> is that, mm, and uh, so they, uh, he was very much uh, uh, helpful for uh, governance reforms. So push the, uh, uh, in, putting the uh, outside directors in, into the Japanese companies and the changing many, many rules in the, uh, uh, I mean, public companies rules and the corporate governance uh, accord. So that, seems to be uh, encouraging the uh, the good company uh, who the who, where who who are really trying to change or trans transform themselves because those outside directors and the pressure from the market they can use uh, the outside pressure to change themselves so i i, I quite my question sure the company like a toyota or hitachi or a sony or those company really uh i mean transformed well so that's oh, the, i mean fantastic. Uh, the, the, so hitachi is is doing all all the yeah, right they really changed so, uh, so and as much as my book is about the the twenty percent, your book is really about the other eighty percent, right? So, so the CX, the, your your idea of this yes, yes, yes. transformation. So, what are you advising these companies to do? Uh, well, basically, uh, some of them are my client, and some of them I'm on the board. So, uh, basically, what I'm uh, I mean pushing them into uh, st strongly is that uh, they re the first thing they have to change the, their governance systems. So uh, the board must be strong, and especially strong in terms of the uh, choosing and uh, terminating the CEOs. That's one problem, because about uh, one challenge is because many cases Japanese companies salary from uh, uh, of the of the salary man for the salary by the salary man. So uh, basically, CEO are chosen 
but, but based on the consensus of the salary mans, such as the labor unions that are choosing the CEOs. So I think that's, that's not right, right ideas. So uh, we are always trying to uh, find the best CEO all the time. And if the current CEO is not good, we should terminate him or her uh, anytime. And if the CEO is good, we, we should keep that CEO forever. So that dynamics is something we really need to the uh, Japanese companies. But to do that, uh, they cannot do that by themselves because it, their mentality is more like a village, I mean, small village, I mean, internal circle. So uh, they tend to uh, uh, put more importance on the uh, balance or harmony inside the uh, village. But uh, if we believe the, uh, for the person who is still 40 age, for age 40 is good, we should, we should put him as a CEO even though many, many people are made older than him, but it, 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 really, it used to be very difficult for a Japanese company. So, but as outside directors, we can do that because we, we, I don't have to care about those kind of mentalities. So those things are one thing that's important. And the other thing is, that especially I'm, I'm pushing recently, is that reshuffling the business portfolio and the function for portfolios. Because now disruptive innovation coming in, so some business really dies and some business really grows. So, but, but the, the, the very typically Japanese key company try to keep both. So then what happens, especially in that, like a carnival is that growing business has to subsidize the uh, dying businesses and they both die. So uh, it, when, when, when we face that situation, we should get rid of all business and the, focusing the, uh, their resource into the growing businesses. But that's very difficult for Japanese companies. It's like a family. So one, one guy becomes diseased, the, the, the other guy has to work hard and uh, uh, pay for them. So that's a typical mentality of Japanese companies. So we have to change that uh, behaviors, but also they need the outside pressures. So uh, that, those are things I'm trying to do. So uh, Makiko has a question that is actually similar to what I was gonna ask. So let me rephrase her question a little bit. We used to accuse Japanese companies uh, of what, what, what is called competitive convergence. That is, when one company did something, the other had to do the same thing. So arguably, you know, this is how, you know, Hitachi and Toshiba both got into nuclear power and then they both got out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so there, there's lots of where, where investment decisions were made based on the competitive behavior of the other company. And just in order not to fall behind in market share, uh, companies would then invest all go, you know, a lockstep into the same direction. Do you see sure. more of a diversified sort of competitive strategy making now? And, and, and how is that coming about? Uh, there. There, there are two factors uh, to uh, react to that problem. One is the uh, decision-making systems. Um, typically, Japanese companies' decision-making systems are very consensus-based. So uh, such as, I mean, Me Too behavior is more likely to get the consensus from the organizations. Because simply, oh, Toshiba is doing this, Hitachi, we have to do that. So that is very much fitting to the Japanese people's behavior. And also uh, the, the fact that if Toshiba is doing something is that uh, evidence that that is a good market, growing market. So it's more easy to get the consensus one problem. And uh, so, uh, but the, most of the case, strategically right decision is doing something different, doing something nobody has done yet. So uh, it's not easy to get the consensus on that kind of strategic behavior. So that's why I need the, uh, for that situations, uh, most of the cases it's okay to bottom up consensus base. It's okay if the decision is more operational matters, but the strategic matters, they need a more top down strong leadership decision making. So we need a strong CXOs. So that's one problem. And the other problem is that uh, maybe both market, stock market and uh, those uh, board members they are very, very insensitive about the profitability. They do care about the revenues, shares. And uh, very interesting, uh, maybe uh, thought of typical Japanese managers is that they say, Toyama-san, if we focus too much onto the profitability, we will lose the long-term growth. Very typical comments. 
But I would say, for the if now we are in the uh, uh, disruptive innovation eras. So uh, to keep the uh, growth, we have to challenge the innovations. But the most of the innovation is very risky, as your husband's book in, in, implies, <laughs> lead and disrupt. So, uh, but to put the money into the risky things, the, we need a very rich cash because we might lose all the money. But the Japanese company very typically borrow the money and those, I mean, low money to the innovation, innovation challenge. And they face, they all of a sudden face the bankruptcy. So that's a very typical behavior, such as uh, what happened in the semiconductor business. So my point is that if you really stick to your long-term growth under the uh, uh, disruptive innovation era, we have to generate very rich cash from the uh, incumbent businesses. Because the a operating cash flow, EBITDA, is the equity money. Because we don't have to uh, give that back to somebody else, right? So, uh, uh, but that's a, the reality, but the, still many, many Japanese companies uh, manage the behavior is the uh, uh, top line is most important things. That's why if we feel like, I, I mean, Toshiba's business is, looks like nice, we should do the same things because surely market is there. That's a two, two big problems. Well, there's also sort of the, as you just said, the consensus and the safety first and let's not take a risk. And mm -hmm. if, if we both do it and we both fail, we look okay. But if only we do it and we fail, we look like fools. Yes, yes. Right? Very, very true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something like a metaphor of the red signals. <laughs> if everybody so, goes back across the red uh, signals, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so autonomics was, uh, was in, in many ways... Uh, uh, about changing that, right? And so uh, my impression of Ibernomics has been that uh, part of what it made it so powerful is that it used nudging and shaming as very important tools, right? And uh, uh, so my, my example on this, and I'd like to hear you a little bit talk about that, was the JPX 400, which I believe you, you actually were involved in designing that or coming up with the idea. Yeah, yeah. The JPX 400 looked like an index, right? So it was an index of 400 companies. Mm -hmm. What was the real purpose? So, you know, partially it was because the Nikkei 225 is getting old and the topics is too big. And, but why did Japan need another index and why did it have to be 400? Uh, well, JPX 400 seems like a really a distinction between 20% and 80%. Right. Uh, Nikkei 225 is a little bit too small number because even though the uh, the company is not in 225, it's not really a big shame. But 400 is good, very good numbers. <laughs> so uh, for the company like a Panasonic, um, if they fall out from the 400, it's a big, big shame, and they feel like oh, we are we are we are, we are failing. So uh, that gives you because and I mean still the culture is very much shame based. <laughs> Uh, of shame. So uh, it's very stimulating <laughs> that people, uh, the company who is not not want to drop out. <laughs> so that gives very good pressure uh, for the those company in between 28 percent, 80 percent. So that's good things about the uh, uh, abenomics, <laughs> I, I believe. And that's, uh, that's why I'm well, so much it's also, I, I guess, for the employees of these companies, right? So if you if you work for a company that suddenly drops out of the 400, you basically, and you're very talented, you basically know that- uh, Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, right, right. So uh, it's uh, also influ influential in terms of the labor market when, they, when the company try to get the nice people, uh, the, the company try, want to retain the nice people, uh, that will of course affect. And uh, the recently uh, many companies are putting the uh, uh, more or less stock incentive into that. So naturally, whether inside the JPX 400 or not, uh, of course, pricing, price, price range changes. So many, many of those things are, are I mean, positively affect the, uh, the company's behavior to raise the productivity and the raise the profitability and uh, uh, making the more drastic strategic decisions. I'm quite, 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 I'm quite, quite, quite I agree with that. So while we're talking about people, uh, Jack and Robbie have questions on labor. So uh, Robbie wants to know where, how the new talent that will be needed for the DX 
uh, where, where that talent will come from. And, and Jack wants to know about labor mobility, that, which is related, I think, um, okay. that, uh, you know, that, that Hitachi suddenly says, oh, yeah, you can go away, but you can come back and then yes. job changes, get, get, a, get a salary boost. And uh, so the, the membership system is eroding, right? It's changing. So can you talk a little bit more about this talent, which is another version of the 28th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, right. good. Um, membership systems still, I believe, works at the operational levels, like a, such like a factory or uh, salespeople. But uh, it would not work as for the, uh, uh, the uh, function like uh, development and research and the corporate planning and the marketing and so more more i mean uh individual capability is important and so that's the, the typically i mean um uh building app or u utilizing dx uh technologies and those things are not well fitting to the uh, uh i mean membership systems and for instance, where if the uh, Hitachi try to get the uh, very top layer AI engineers, uh, they never get the, uh, the, the membership systems. Because I mean, peak of the AI engineer, actually my second son is uh, 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 I mean, doing the startups as uh, the AI engineer. And, uh, but there, as an engineer, their peak is maybe at, at most 10 years, middle thirties. So, uh, so, the companies promise that you you're going to be promoted age 40 50 and uh, so why don't we why don't you come to Hitachi it never works because they understand their peak is until 30 30 34 35 so uh, they so they they should put more i mean um, job professional systems into the uh, uh, human human resource management practices so those are the things that the challenge they are facing and also uh, um, companies more i mean uh, frequently reshuffle their business and functions for, with other companies so the, another big challenge is that, so that's why that's what one of the things i faced when we when we went through the uh, kind of restructuring actually we didn't we did not fire anybody from kind of action but we uh, cut the uh, piece by piece and we to 40 pieces uh, out to the um, Carnival company and sell each function and business to other companies. But uh, uh, of course we want to keep, I want to, I mean, encourage those people to work you know, at, at, the, at the better, better, I mean, conditions to other companies. But, but of course we have to but, uh, write down some credentials and uh, what they can do and skills and so on and so forth to, when we introduce those people to other companies. But uh, Japanese companies don't, never recorded that kind of things. So uh, if we ask the guy what we can do, what you can do, please tell me. Of course, I, I, I will sell your uh, capability to the other new companies. But then he says, I can do the manage of the carnival, that's it. <laughs> but uh, as you know, the, uh, there's a, in, under lifetime employment system, of course, the, uh, the role of manager is different company by company. And his capability pretty much based upon the, uh, their knowledge about the uh, Carnival companies. So he's doing a great job because he knows everybody in Carnival. That's why he can manage uh, the work as the managers. But if we move it to other companies, the people are different. <laughs> so uh, that's a big challenge when we, when we try to reshuffle a dynamism of the uh, function of business across the companies, across the industries. But that is must today. So that's, those are the big challenges Japanese companies are facing. So that's why actually, I, I believe Hitachi is trying to introduce you know, some job uh, description and uh, rating systems and, and the more, more market-based rating system for the global, I mean, workers. So those are the things we have to go through, but uh, it takes maybe a decade at least. So if you, uh, you know, could talk a little bit about the perspective of the CEOs. Yeah. Uh, so the, the good one, right? The, 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 the ones that, that have a vision, that, that, mm -hmm. that see what's happening, that understand. And there are many, many of those. Right? And yeah. People often say that that doesn't exist, that person doesn't exist in Japan, but that's not true. I mean, we could easily now come up with 50 names of outstanding leadership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, yeah. right so what is what is their biggest concern right now and what is their biggest challenge so what does it take to to really do it in japan right now okay um so uh 
there's a couple of misunderstanding about the uh, uh, choosing or I mean um, raising or uh, developing and choosing the good CEOs. Uh, one is a very easy thought that um, if you don't have a good candidate inside a company, why don't you get somebody from outside? Uh, very, very easy thought. <laughs> and, uh, it might work and uh, even Carlos Gorn works at the early days. Uh, but uh, uh, I would say that is a very limited situation uh, when the company is really facing a turnaround. And uh, if the company has a very strong shareholders like IRCJ or Renault, uh, if IRCJ send a very capable leader to the uh, uh, failing and bankrupt company, he works or she works. But uh, if we bring the, uh, those guys to the normal companies, he or she never works. So the basically challenge should be uh, company itself should have the uh, strong candidates. But to, to realize that, I mean, uh, situations, uh, there is there is more long-term plan to develop the uh, good people from inside. And, uh, but uh, many still Japanese P company believe that it's okay to start around the age 50. Because they don't like choosing the uh, CEO candidate uh, at, from the early days. And they believe that discourage other people. They all thought, all, they all thought. <laughs> and uh, I would say, I'm sorry, in Panasonic, I would say, I'm quite sure 99% of the workers, they don't want to be a CEO. Because they know that CEO job today is very, very hard. We're killing your life, killing your family. <laughs> so uh, CEO is not really, I mean, uh, reward. It's a responsibility. <laughs> so, uh, um, and the, those, I mean, value change is also happening in, in your country. So uh, uh, I, so both the, uh, he or he, he or she, he, uh, the, the candidates himself, themselves, also the company, both understand the, uh, the to be a really great CEO or lead management leaders, they have to train themselves from around, I mean, um, 30 or more younger days. They need strong will and the training and education and experiences. So those are the big challenges many companies are facing. So when I become a sort of nomination committee members of those large companies, uh, first things I would, uh, I strongly recommend them is that why don't you start up the new program starting from around age 30. Then if someone is developed very quickly and he is okay, ready around age 40, why don't we get him as a CEO around age 40? It's okay. So, but that's still wrong way to realize that, that things. Actually, but the old one is already ready for that. So, so I think there are many companies that are ready for this. So, so, so my impression is this. Let me see what you think of this. Uh, in the old days, in the old Japan, so last century, see mm -hmm. the successful CEO of a Japanese company didn't have to be a visionary. They just had to execute the Miti's strategy. So Miti would say, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And we're going to, you know, steel is going to be big or cars is going to be big or electronics is going to be big. And then the companies were allotted some certain yeah, 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 yeah. Right. hierarchy and now go execute. Yes. And so yes. the CEOs needed to be uh, really right, right. good. So they, they never make any strategic decision. So it's okay. Just execution. Right? So they were just operations people. But today, CEOs have to have a vision. They have to do this, not the competitive version, not the me too approach, yeah, yeah, yeah. and do something else. And that, you know, so, so that, that's still not, it's slowly developing, right? But there's very little coaching, there's very little right, you know, right. targeted. Everybody's still so polite, you know, let's not hurt anybody's feelings. So we're not gonna say who's gonna be the CEO until the last moment. And, mm -hmm. So, so what, how can you bring about that change? Um, okay, so again, back to the uh, selections uh, criteria. So uh, the first thing we have to do is we, 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 de we redefine the criteria or role of CEO. As you said, operational leaders uh, not have to be CEO. It's okay to be COO, right? right? Yeah. 
well, that's why operational officer. So, uh, so but the, there used to be typically COO uh, become CEO. That's a very typical way. But I am saying it's not, not, not the right way anymore. See, we, of course, we need CEO or we need the COOs if, if they have uh, multiple businesses. But the CEO's job is more like, I mean, more drastic, drastic, drastic decision making. Sometimes makes you some people unhappy and some people happy inside the company. Right? And, and it might make many unhappy, <laughs> possibly. So, uh, but, uh, but to do that, it, typically nice operational leader is very nice person, very rounded and the good communication skills and everybody like him and no enemies, that's the, that's criteria. But if you want to become a good CEO, but, but maybe opposite. So I'm quite sure that some people really like, like, like me, but the, some people in Japan really hate me. It's okay. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing the right job. So um, uh, since you brought Carlos Ghosn up, we have, we have two questions regarding corporate governance and, and this point. So, um, so we just wants to know whether the Carlos Ghosn case was an outlier or whether there's still some governance issues. And Tucker would like to know on this point of CEO selection, whether it's not the role of the board to appoint the next CEO. So, so yeah, he yeah. thinks there might be some, also some issues in this process about how, you know, of how Japanese companies still appoint the CEO. Ah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Carlos Ghosn's case, I mean, um, we very much represent the, uh, uh, I mean, right side and dark side of Japanese governance today. Uh, what he did in the early days, with structuring a turnaround in the Nissan, is almost not that different from the uh, Inamori san did for the Japan Airlines. Okay, in, in the crisis, Japan companies almost failing, and the new uh, sponsor company came in and pushed the inject the uh, equity. And the, 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 the sponsor brought the a very strong leader and restructure, restructure the company and turn around the company. That's a good story. And, uh, but uh, maybe pro the problem of the uh, Nissan case after that, uh, after that governance of the Nissan was very much, uh, well, how can I say, um, uh, distorted. Because almost uh, the, Nissan is a public company. And their parent company also public company. So double public company situations. And uh, so uh, Renault practically controls the company Nissan. And at the beginning, CEO of the Renault and the Nissan CEO is a different guy. So the Carlos Ghosn became both CEOs. And uh, there's always some in co interest, co conflict of interest between those co two companies because they are doing the same businesses. Right, so as a Renault CEO, Renault, the CEO, CEO have, he have to behave here, behave for the benefit of the Renault shareholders. As a CEO of Nissan, he have to behave for the Nissan's, Nissan's, Nissan's interest. So there's always conflict between that. And also, uh, but the, another uh, uh, tricky part is the uh, Nissan became more competitive than Renault. So naturally, Renault faced some temptation to exploit Nissan for the benefit of the Renault shareholders. And so, the, but the, actually, Gone is very much uh, right on the uh, those balancing two powers. So he could control everything as long as the balance is kept. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that he, the, they, the right answer to get out of that kind of, you know, uh, unhealthy situation, completely merger or split. So they, they, they didn't do both. So then some new, some, some bad things happens. And uh, I'm sure the, uh, if the, I mean, Renault is American company, there's no problem to get very high salary, high, I mean, bonus from Nissan. And it's okay to disclose, but uh, I guess the France is a little bit Japanese <laughs> because they don't like, I mean, those CEO get huge money uh, as a bonus, but so, but so maybe he had to hide his very big bonus to French, French, I mean, Renault's constitu uh, stakeholders and the Nissan stakeholders. That's why that kind of things happen. But uh, um, so 
that is a euro. But the still, as you know, the uh, we have still double public company in Japan, like SoftBanks and uh, NTT Docomo. So yeah, th that's my my I I I'm always saying the uh, those and you know distortion should be cleared. It's not right things. So, so you mentioned Docomo. That's very interesting because it's in the news today. Uh, so Docomo was the was always a subsidiary of NTT. Who's yes. still owned by NTT? It was very successful. It brought the world IMO. So a bunch yeah, of NTT yeah. engineers went out to play. They founded Docomo, and it was they were beyond expectation successful. Yeah. And uh, the news today is that NTT has bought its fifty percent back. Mm -hmm. So Docomo is now going to be yet again. Uh, this is not a subsidiary, but a part of NTT. Is this a good development? I mean, or should should NTT have just sent them off? I mean, they're going to mess them up, or what? What uh, will it take for this okay. to become a success story? Uh, I would say, from uh, KDDI or SoftBank's point of view, that's very good things. It's good news. Yeah, because I mean, Docomo was very the peak peak of the Docomo was when was when Docomo was managed very independently from NTT. So very they, they used to be very aggressive. They used to be a very innovators. And but uh, that was the first CEO, Oboshan was a very innovative person and Oboshan hated NTT. So they behave like a very much new, I mean, common carriers, not like, I mean, legacy carriers. Actually, I was, I was working for the, uh, 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 I mean, the SoftBank's original company. So I was on the new, 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 uh, new entrant side. So uh, we really had a hard time because uh, the legacy carriers behave, behave, behave like a new, new carriers. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, after, after the almost sound, uh, basically, those CEOs are traditionally sent from the elite entity people from their parent company, and they gradually became very, very conservative company. That, that's, that's KDI and uh, SoftBank had a great chance to get the, get the market back. Yeah. Because they are very slow in terms of the introducing iPhone, and they are very slow in, in terms of introducing the uh, Android. Uh, Android handset. So, uh, so, and, uh, and actually, as a group, I would say on this consolidated base, 70-80% of the profit comes from Docomo, not from NTT. Right. So, if that merger happens in different way, such as NTT Docomo acquires NTT, it's going to be a big threat for SoftBank and KDE. But but the N, if MT, if MTT is not making money, very classic, very slow move company, right? If that kind of slow traditional company acquires Docomo, Docomo will become even slower. So so, so this is a good segue to Suga-san because um, apparently this the this merger is a reaction to Suga-san's the Prime Minister Suga's request that we lower Japan lower the rates for the for the cell phone bills, which are not that high to begin with, but okay. Uh, politically, oh. yes, but uh, I mean, uh, politically, maybe um, Suga-san uh, more easily to influence on the Dokomo's behaviors, but uh, as a business, uh, well, it's not not right format. So, so um, if I were a manager of the Dokomo or entity, I will let the Dokomo to buy out the parent company. So, so let's talk a little bit about the, I don't know what it's going to be called, Suganomics maybe. So Abenomics is over. Uh, prime Minister Abe has resigned. We now have a new prime minister. Well, the, does that change anything in terms of uh, Yeah, yeah, good point. Actually, as for the macro policy, such as the uh, easing the finance and uh, so forth, they would not change. Uh, the point is that as for the mi micro, I mean, policy, such as the uh, regulations and uh, uh, I mean, metabolism of the industries and so forth, that will, I mean, become more drastic because Abe-san was a very nice person, very nice person. And uh, they, he is very okay to encourage the good, strong company to be stronger, it's okay, such as the governance reforms. But uh, he was a little bit hesitant 
to um, push the uh, um, unproductive companies or industry out the market. So he didn't like that kind of, I mean, drastic reforms. Yeah, but the Sugasa is very much pro that kind of reform and structural reforms. So, uh, and so always the uh, regulation issues and uh, uh, reshuffling of the economy and the company and, and exit and uh, so that kind of things. Uh, its challenge is that some people are, especially people who have the best of interest face the, uh, I mean, very serious situations. And uh, I would, I would, I would imagine Tsugasan is more insensitive about that issue. And uh, but then my point is that I, I actually, for all the way, I've been advising the Abesan and the Tsugasan the same way uh, as for the uh, those reshuffling and the re structural reforms. It's be, we are now in the big chance because we are facing labor shortage because of the aging aging society. So uh, given that labor is in shortage, they don't have to worry about the unemployment too much. Yeah, if we, uh, if we, I mean, uh, bankrupt the company and uh, let the, some industry out of the market, though labor can find a way. And uh, most likely they will find a better job because dying company, dying inst industries, no way to have the good wage from that industry. So point is that how can we uh, raise the productivity of those industries and uh, uh, shift the, uh, those labor to the better productivity, productivity company or the, uh, the industries? And especially low productivity happens not in manufacturing. Low productivity happens in the service sectors in this country, such as hotels and uh, I mean transportation and uh, uh, restaurants and so on and so forth, and the medical services also. So uh, uh, maybe the Tsugasan, Tsugasan should challenge that uh, the raising the productive, pushing, pushing, push, to, push those industries to raise the, raise the productivity and the raise the wage. And if they kind of catch up with those hurdle, that they should get, let, let them exit from the market. Those kind of reshuffling is one of the big challenge Tsugasan is, is, is facing. And it, as for the, as, as, as long as he is saying so far, I think he moving to the right directions. And especially SME is a big, big challenge for this country because nowadays 70% of the uh, workers are working at SME, not large companies. And the, and the, and the, and the maybe I would average wage is less than half to the large companies. But uh, unless we raise the wage of those 70% of the workers, uh, there is no chance to truly really recover the, uh, this economy. And actually, those companies are now 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 facing the uh, very serious situation because of the Corona, COVID, nineteen shock, and but uh, it, it's a big big a uh, big crisis for those weak workers, seventy percent weak workers. But also that that can be a great chance to reform structurally those industry and uh, uh, consolidate it into the stronger company and raise their wage. So the question is that we're now facing this crisis. Uh, simply giving the money to the old we company and the make zombie or restructure those industries and company to be a better productive high wage industry. It's a two ways now. So the labor shortage really is the big chance, right? Because yes. it takes yes. away the, the concern about social stability. Mm -hmm. And so, so this can be done. Shujiro has a question that, that I, think I, I think is a really good question. He says, what do you think is the future of the Japanese economy? I'm so worried, he says. Uh, are you worried about the future of the Japanese economy? Or, you know, so your book is, is about the 80% that need to change. My book is about the 20% of the wonderful, where, where does that leave us, right? So are we, is, uh, is yeah, yeah. passing gonna be over pretty soon? Are we gonna see some rebound here? Okay, uh, if we look at the economy as a, a function of the populations, uh, there is no great future because anyway, population declines. But if you look at the uh, Japanese economy's future as a productivity improvement, we have a great future. Because uh, the fact that those 70% of the industries or companies are very, very low productivity, it implies big margin to improve. It's like uh, somebody is running a 100 meters race, maybe 30 seconds, right? 
it's possible to raise 30 seconds to 20 seconds. 30% improvement. You bring into 15% two times. But if we go to Toyota, like company Toyota, and in the production line, it's impossible to raise the property by 50%. But the, when we actually acquire many local bus companies and those companies are losing money and were almost bankrupt, we came in and they put, put in new management know-how and IT, IT technologies and digital technologies, and they're all profitable now. Even those bus are, are located in Tohoku or those population declining areas, all black, all black. And the wages usually raised by 10 to, 10 to 20%. So it's possible because they were running at the, I mean, 30 seconds per, for 100 meters. We can improve maybe to the 20 seconds. So we have 70% of the economies are still 30 seconds for 100 meters. So this situation has been like this for 20 years. What does it take? What will it take to, to, to get the, the regional economies and the small farms and the, and the big farms that are running 30 seconds runs, what, what would it take to, to make them run faster? What, what uh, has the, the, uh, slow, slow, I mean, so the small company, large company? Well, you know what, so if you were, if you were the prime minister, you want them to change, what would you do? Ah, yeah, 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 that's quite simple, quite simple. I would, I would raise the uh, mini, uh, minimum wage. Okay. Then uh, the company who cannot pay the minimum, which they will quit, or they will sell themselves to somebody else. Right? And uh, uh, re recently, because of the financial policy, we cannot use the interest rate for market discipline, especially SMEs. Uh, if you are the public company, the stock market pressure will make the company to raise the productivity. Otherwise, they will sell their stock. But 70% uh, of the economy is not public company. So uh, one pressure should be coming from the labor market, is one way. Now, the other way is the uh, behavior of the banks, because they are lending the money. So they are sort of a capital player. So they should put the uh, more positive, healthy capital pressure to those SMEs to encourage them to sell themselves to a better company. So the, your solution is not to close the small companies down. Your solution is to create a much more, even more vibrant domestic M&A market where whatever small companies that have some technology but are inefficient could then more easily merge. And that would be driven by either the price mechanism, that is the, the labor costs, yeah, or yeah. the bank's Push. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, some companies, they don't have the, uh, the I mean, buyer for them. And uh, the manager is very old and it's okay to close down. But the problem is that, another problem is that um, typically those companies are putting the uh, personal guarantee to the bank loans. That's why they cannot quit. When they close the company, the, the, those loan left and they're gonna pay back, they have to personally bankrupt. And the, the house is gone and all the asset, personal asset gone. So I'm, I'm also uh, saying that they should release the personal guarantee. Uh -huh. So that's a big, more, I would say 70, 80% of the SMEs are putting the, uh, uh, have, uh, having the personal guarantee to the company loan. So that's why they cannot quit. So now recently, many, many companies facing, nobody takes over the company. And the government used to be try to I mean, extend the life of the company. But yeah. the fact that nobody, the sons and daughters, uh, they don't succeed the company is that they, those daughters and sons are not, they don't think that business is good. They don't, they don't think their parents' life is good, right? Because the business is not good. So in that case, they should let it close. Let, yes, let it close the business. And, and because there's a personal guarantee on the loan, the bank also doesn't foreclose because then they have to foreclose the personal assets and they don't want to be seen as a sure, local sure. player that, that, that destroys households and families. Yes, and so. Yes, 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 yes. so there's still a lot of work at that end of the Japanese economy, that's for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And so uh, we could go on for 
we could go on for hours, but I want to be respectful of your time and also our time is up. So allow me to make some final remarks uh, before we close today's day. Uh, let me just briefly bring up my uh, slides again. So um, uh, I would like to take this moment to thank all of you uh, and uh, participants, speakers. Uh, we started the Japan Zoominar uh, in April. So this has been our 21st. We have been 20, 21 hour, uh, weeks in lockdown and uh, Toyama san you, you uh, joined us for the 21st uh, edition of the Zoominar. And uh, so I, 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 I want to thank all of you, especially the regular guests, and, and ask you for your help. Um, if this is of value to you, it would be terrific if you could consider uh, audience uh, to contribute to uh, our uh, situation here by making a, uh, uh, a small or, or uh, also uh, would be happy to receive a, a large donation to JFIT. Uh, the way to do this is to go to jfit.ucsd.edu support and click, um, this is on our website, and click the Give Now button. If you'd like to be involved in larger programmatic uh, decision-making and activities at JFIT, by all means, please do send me an email. So if this is of value to you, we'd appreciate uh, helping the, the staff that, that makes sure that I'm not pushing the wrong buttons and uh, uh, making this all happen. So thank you very much. Next week, we'll have Andrew Yeo, uh, who is a professor of politics and director of Asian studies at the Catholic University. He just wrote a book about Asia's regional architecture. And this is about the regional security uh, and the alliances in the Pacific that are, um, one might think uh, under duress. Uh, that's next week at the same time. And uh, thank you all. And with that, uh, stay healthy and stay well, and we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toyama-san. You're and, welcome. Uh, see you again. Bye -bye. Uh, goodbye.